Just waiting here. All right. We are live. We are live. We are live. We are live. How is everybody doing? It's going to be on there. And uh, yeah, it'll be on there. So if you guys are bored today, I understand that the, the quarantine has been in effect for about uh, called Confederates in the Attic by Tony Harwitz. Unfortunately, he died last year and I just finished it this morning. And uh, I just wanted to discuss it with you guys because it's a, it's probably in my top 10 civil war books next up there with uh, battle cry freedom. And um, just by looking at how Tony Horowitz just describes his journeys throughout the South, it just really hits you that how the war really impacted the whole entirety of American society, just as the coronavirus is impacting every aspect of American society. And it really comes to a point where it's just, there's a lot of things that are relatable, you know, and uh, it's, it's really interesting to see how Tony Horowitz, even by discussing the importance of the war with people such as Robert Lee Hodge, who's the guy on the cover here. He, he's a hardcore Civil War reenactor. Just talks about how this, what the Civil War meant to him. And in the, even in the book, they go on a really huge, <laughs> and I mean huge, tour throughout the war. Basically, in the Eastern Theater going to every single major Civil War battlefield from Antietam to Chancellorsville. Obviously, Gettysburg is in there, but then there's Fredericksburg. There's uh, so many other things that show you that how the Civil War is still meaningful to people today, even if it means for the battles of Confederate statues or through the battles of the Confederate battle flag. It's, it's all there. But there's times in the book where it really makes you uncomfortable. It makes you really angry. There's a chapter in here where he talks about civil war POWs and the uh, impact of uh, people dying. Um, the downplay of suffering that was at Andersonville. Um, the impact of just unsheer madness of the fact that people in that area in Georgia still have not gotten over Henry Rich being executed as a war criminal, still haven't gone over the fact that, oh, what about our boys in northern prisons? But at the same time, they, when you look at it, Andersonville was the worst POW camp throughout the whole entire war. The conditions were horrible. Men were exposed to the elements. They were starving. They were dying of diseases. And if you looked at my, if you watched some of my recent uh, videos, I talked about James Henry Gooding, who was a member of the 54th Massachusetts, and he was eventually captured and he died at Andersonville. And he's buried there today. What about him? And what really made me really mad was the part where he talks about these group of, of, Southerners in Georgia where they may said, Oh, here where the where good Yankees are buried in the ground. <sighs> that's still, I'm going to be blunt. That still pisses me off that the site should, that, that the site eventually has to, you know, um, talk about all POWs of wars. But at the same time, it's like, you got to talk about the POWs experience there. It was bad. Everybody Andersonville was bad. And I could see why many soldiers coming back home for the war were so traumatized by it. It comes to show you that more men died from disease and imprisonment than on battlefields. And also shows you how unprepared people were expecting the war to be. You know, people were expecting the war to end in three months. And it went on for four and a half years, ended in June of 1865. And the prisons show this. They weren't expecting this to happen. And it really comes to a point where 
some nuance and ambiguity need to be taken into consideration of this. And I really like to see the Andersonville to really, instead of just showing all POWs awards to specifically talk about the POWs experience at Andersonville and it's showing what the atrocities that occurred there. And I know some, some lost cause people come on here and say, Oh, Henry Wirtz was a hero. He didn't blame his superiors, even though he kind of did questionable things to you, to union soldiers, which he did. If you ever seen the movie Andersonville it really shows that, that he was actually a liar. <laughs> claiming that he was wounded in battle, even though he wasn't. Because in the movie, they show him as like in an arm sling or something like that, showing that he was wounded. But I think he was either A, he was faking it, or B, he wasn't and he didn't like tell him about it, or he just said that, oh, I was in battle, or it must have been a horse injury. <laughs> so there's a lot of nuance in that. And it just, and the author, Tony Horwitz, even himself, went up to the Rangers said, oh, you're not the first one to come in here pissed off. Because if they, if they ever say one negative thing about the Confederates, they'll immediately get ostracized by the community there in Andersonville in, in uh, southern Georgia. I think it's the south, southeastern part of the state because I've, I've been to Georgia. I've been through that area. I've been to Fort Pulaski. I've been to all those areas. But I've never been to Andersonville, and I, I would love to go there someday and uh, find James Henry Gooding. Maybe find some of my Wisconsin guys in there. Cause I'm from Wisconsin. So, um, but it eventually just comes to a point where even in the book too, um, there's a lot of nuance and ambiguity went describing people who people just like who glorify and romanticize a lost cause. Also people during the civil rights movement, how they romanticize and glorify it. And I wonder if I could find I'm, I'm, I'm sifting through the pages here. I want to find, um, I, I underlined this last night. I was doing a lot of underlining in this book. So it's really uh, something really good. Okay, here we go. So Tony Horowitz is talking to one of the um, professors or teachers or activists in Selma, Alabama, which was the site of uh, Martin Luther King's um, march to restore the right, the right to vote. And that's with the 1965 Civil Rights Act, which gave him re-franchise the right to vote. And he said, I asked her if I was wrong in sensing a plant of nostalgia among others in the audience. She says, you're right. It's depressing because so little has really changed, she said. We still have the same. We integrated the schools, so now all the whites go on their own. Whites, are still make, whites here still make three times as much as the blacks. What's to feel good about? And it just shows you that both sides really, even in the aspect of the civil rights movement and the civil war, people on both sides romanticize everything. And there's a lot of nuance and ambiguity in that. And it really blew my mind as to how people treat the, the war, even in the book too, people, even, even African-Americans said that Abraham Lincoln, oh, he was a benevolent racist or that, oh, he only used the soldiers to treat him. He only used soldiers to come over to the Union to use them as slaves, even though 180,000 African-Americans signed on to fight for the Union and help free their families, which doesn't make sense at all, but I digress. But I can understand why now because of that. And you can also understand, even though I really... um. <laughs> If you ever watch those videos where um, try not to cringe challenges, I cringed a lot when he when he interviewed Lost Cause people. It made me cringe so much, um, especially the part where he talks about um, people in North Carolina who, in my opinion, deceive and mistaught and lie to their children about what the Civil War was and saying that, oh, the Confederates are outnumbered at Gettysburg, even though... <laughs> Tell that to the third core at the Peach Orchard and Devil's Den where they had to face about 14, 15, 20,000 Confederates assaulting them and managed to hold on as long as they could. Ask that to the first Minnesota who had only 262 men fighting up against 14, 1,500 Confederates in front of them. Don't tell me the South was outnumbered at Gettysburg because they weren't. 
the South Gettysburg to me is like, a, is like the underdog with the overwhelming numbers and the Goliath with the underwhelming numbers. So I consider Gettysburg to be the South Goliath and the union David at Gettysburg. So to me, it's kind of like a, a sporting event and Gettysburg the Union created one of the biggest upsets of the war. They beat Robert E. Lee and proved that they could fight because when you look at the aspect of Gettysburg, Confederates were being very cocky and very overconfident, and this included Robert E. Lee as well. He essentially thought that this was the same army that he fought at Chancellorsville, that, oh, they're going to run July 1st, caused heavy casualties among the Confederates, even though the 11th Corps and the 1st Corps, if you read about it, were completely battered, but held on as long as they could so that the Union could gain the high ground south of the town. And the 11th Corps redeems itself. The Iron Brigade, my guys from Wisconsin, lost so many guys, but managed to hold on despite overwhelming odds and create heavy casualties among the Confederates. This includes the 26th North Carolina. And then obviously, second day, they were unnumbered, but they held on as long as they could and they counterattacked and held them back. You know, and that's what he also described in that book too, is where technically the Union was actually outnumbered, not, not the Confederates. And I know that's going to sound so unpopular among lost cause lovers, but that's my personal opinion on Gettysburg, but I'm digressing from what we're talking about. Anyway, I just wanted to get that out there. Anyway, this book really, really made an impact on me and how I think about the Civil War. And really, it shows how everybody, in a sense, has their own view about historical memory and historical thought. Because when you look at memory, memory is flawed. Okay, memory is specifically flawed to a point where you tend to romanticize the past. And that's specifically, specifically maintained with the lost cause, the civil rights movement, and even the civil war. And uh, because, again, people look at it through an emotional standpoint without actually studying the historical reality. Gettysburg, the last invasion. He shows the historical realities of Gettysburg. and shows even the unknown stories that people don't talk about. And it just really comes a show where memory has specifically impacted the historiography of so many civil war literature over the past years that I just tend to say, I want to stay away from that. And that includes Douglas Southout Freeman. I don't know about Bruce Ken. I have a stillness at Appomattox. I still want to read that though, but Bruce Ken is still up there. But when it comes to lost cause literature such as Douglas South Alfred Men, I tend to stay away from that because I know that's based more on on praising and making Lee into a deified God, even though he was a, the most humanist of human beings and one of the biggest colossal screw ups. But that was his worst moment. Um because he lost a third of his army there. He lost a third of his army. So how is how could that be your proudest moment as a commander? Yeah, taking responsibility is good, but at the same time, at the end of the day, you're saying, "Oh crap, I really screwed this up. I should have, I should have listened," you know. And that's why memory is so flawed, because when people think about Pickett's Charge, it's based on memory and romanticization. Where when you look at the assault, it wasn't pretty. It was graphic and bloody. People's arms and heads being blown off, you know. One tour guide even said that there was so much Confederate blood in the road that it was ankle deep in some places. Um, <laughs> um, Union soldiers would say they saw red mist coming out of the Emmitsburg Road when they unleashed their muskets. Uh, I think it was, they said it was 1,700 muskets fired on them. And it said red mist came out of the road. And one Ohio soldier said when he saw the artillery effects on Pickett's charge said arms, blankets, guns, heads, and knapsacks were tossed into a clear air. That doesn't sound romantic at all, you guys. That's war. It's horrifying. And by specifically doing that memory, you're completely erasing the whole other aspect of 
what it really happened. And that's why the whole aspect of viewing on Pickett's division really is just a, it's mind boggling to think about it because the North Carolinians, the Mississippians, they did all the work there while the Virginians got all the glory. You know, the 26th North Carolina, by the, by the beginning of the battle, they had 889 men, I believe. And then by the end of the battle, there was only 73, 72 guys left for roll call. What about their story? What about them? They never get talked about. You know what I mean? So it really is an aspect where it just really comes to a point and keep on sharing this guys. Don't just have one or two or three people come in in here. Come on, share this, share this link because I want to keep on continue talking about this and related to what's going on today. So please keep on sharing this live stream. Cause I think it, I want to get as many people in here again so we can have a little discussion. So anyway, sorry, I just want to point that out there. But again, memory is flawed. It's flawed. Dennis Fried, what, what is this? I'm not leaving the site. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, there was a little Google pop up. Anyway, anyway, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, memory. Um, even Dennis Fry, when I read his book on Antietam, he debunks a lot of myths that go around the Antietam campaign and the battle itself. I I agree with this thesis because again, memory is flawed. Like even there's quotes where from people who were weren't even at Antietam or weren't things that were set by Robert E. Lee. There was a quote that's saying, We shall stand on those hills. That's not from Robert E. Lee. That's from a guy who was fighting at the Burnside Bridge at Antietam. And I remember being there. And there's no record of Robert E. Lee even saying this. So that's why that's why I tend to stay away from this kind of literature because I don't want to be deceived or get caught up in it in the emotional aspects of it. Because that's not gonna help advance the historiography of the Civil War at all without looking at the historical realities, like Alan Guzzo's book. You know, and it's it really is frustrating when people disregard that. And it's even shocking too when Tony talks about in his book, he talks about how sometimes the Civil War curriculum is not even taught in schools, which is really sad to think about. Because this war is the bloodiest war in our nation's history. It could be up to one million men. I think it I think it should be higher. I think it should be a million men and civilians. Because again, they're not counted. Just like I think Gettysburg should probably be up to 56,000 or 57,000. Because when you think about it, the Army of the Potomac at Gettysburg got hammered by Lee's army. And so Lee's army by the Army of the Potomac. So all this emotional baggage that people think, you know, especially when it comes to Civil War, people get so overwhelmed by the casualties that they don't realize that every number behind that thing is a person. And that they have a great story to tell. And that they had families, they had sons, they had uh, daughters, they had brothers, they had sisters, you know, and it's just, and, if, and this will be apparent when you, if you read uh, Drew Galvin Faust's book, This Republic of Suffering, I highly recommend that book to show the real cost of the war. It's a great book. I'm really telling you that it's really advanced this, the historiography of this war in so many ways. Anyway. But we'll get through this just as the men of the Civil War got through it. Men and women of the Civil War. Um, we're experiencing a dilemma right now. And there's a point where I got to confess to you that I'm scared that one of these days we're going to have like Civil War numbers where like a thousand or three thousand Americans die of the coronavirus in one day. You know, and that's what I'm nervous of is that, you know, if that happens, then more people would have died of this virus than any battle and that includes d-day and antietam antietam is still the bloodiest day in our nation's history with three thousand. even though i think it should be higher because some of them would die after their wounds and there's actually a book i have called one bass hospital which looks at hospital records about confederate and union soldiers of their wounds and whether they recovered or whether they died of of an illness or disease 
half of them died of their wounds. So Antietam's death toll could be so much higher, probably 7,000, probably the same rate as Gettysburg's dead with seven, probably even 10,000 dead. Because again, we don't know the exact number. And uh, it really comes to a point where you got, you just have to think about this. It's mind boggling to think about it, especially in today's site where even in my hometown, 13 people in, uh, in my hometown of Grafton, Wisconsin, half of them, have, 13 of them have been diagnosed with coronavirus. And now I'm thinking like, man, what if those 13 people died in one day? I don't know. And that'd be really sad to be quite honest. And it's just, it's frightening. It's very, very frightening. I'm going to be honest with you. When people say you shouldn't be worried and not panic. I, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I'm a Christian. I do believe God is with me. I do believe he is with me. And to be, he tells us to be strong and courageous and not be afraid. I believe in that. But there's times where you just think about it and where you're just like, any day now, if I touch something random, I could get it. You know, just as Civil War soldiers who died from disease, they're scared like, oh, what if I die from a bullet today or in, in battle? What if I die from a disease that I'll get on the march or something like that? And it just, again, you see the historical echoes that come through this. And it just really is mind, again, it's mind boggling. It's mind boggling. You can't, just, you, you try to wrap your head around it and you just, sometimes you can't. And, um, I just hope people realize and wake up that this is not going to be an easy thing. Just like Americans in the 19th century thought the civil war was going to be over in three months. And then guess what? It happened in June of 1865 <laughs> went on for four and a half years. It's unbelievable. You know, and, and I'm going to be honest too. It's, it's part of that American cockiness that we all have. If you notice that American cockiness, where we think we can win this one thing, you know, just like with the, the Confederacy said, Oh, we have a cavalier military tradition. Well, as Gary Wills says in the documentary, death and sin, we're bloody their nose and they'll think more about this. And they have the union said, Oh, all these undisciplined rebs will whip them all the way to Richmond. And then obviously first battle Bull run comes along 4,000 casualties shocks the nation. Um, Shiloh, with 24,000 casualties. In my opinion, I think that's the appropriate number because that battle was insane, man. It was intense. And then you had the Seven Days Battles. You had Second Bull Run uh, with 20,000 20, casualties, I think. And I'm not sure. Um, and then you have Antietam, Blaze Day, the war, 23,000 casualties, six to seven, probably 10,000 dead. Then you had Fredericksburg. And then you had Corinth. Um. Then you had Chancellorsville, then obviously Gettysburg with 51, possibly 56,000 casualties with 10,000 dead in three days of combat. And then obviously the Overland Campaign, where you, both sides were on all Union fronts in the Battle of, the Battle of Atlanta, Kennesaw Mountain, uh, the Wilderness, Spotsylvania, Cold Harbor, the assault at Petersburg, the Siege of Petersburg, the Siege of Atlanta. When you count the Union dead, dead casualties, there was possibly 60 bodies literally fell apart from musket fire and cannon fire. That happened all over Civil War battlefields, too, might I add. It was not just Spotsylvania. It happened everywhere where people's bodies just fell apart. Um, Peach Orchard at Gettysburg is a great example because after I read that book, I just felt, wow, that's one of the most intense and bloodiest fighting I've ever seen in the war. You know, so it's just then you realize that the war was not going to be over until something crazy happened. And that's why we need to be aware of in our situation today that we should have been prepared for this a long time ago. And we weren't again, you know, we thought, Oh, the coronavirus, that's not going to make it to American shores. We're not going to have the most infected people in the whole entire world. I just looked at it. The statistics today, there's 144,000 cases of it in here in the United States including a thousand in my home state, half of the state has just been infected with coronavirus, except for Door County, <laughs> which is way up in Northern Wisconsin, but it's near Brown County. So I hope people in Brown County are hunkered down, not leaving their places. They don't infect it, but 
Wisconsin is getting hard hit and there's 17 people have died already in the state. And um, it's just really frustrating to see that not only was the Chinese government not prepared to do this, they blatantly ignored it. And also with the United States government, they blatantly ignored it. Thinking that this will be over by, by Easter. It's not going to be over by Easter. You guys, and I don't think it's going to end at May 1st. This might go on for the entire year unless they create a vaccine and unless we take precautions to protect ourselves. Social distancing, like I'm doing. I'm here in my room. Just chilling. You know, and it's... Americans need to realize that our cockiness is what brings us to our downfall. And that's what it brought to downfall of so many casualties in the Civil War as it is doing with today. All right. And that's what I wanted to talk about you guys today. But if you want to like send anything in the chat or send a comment or anything like that, just send it to me. If you want to ask any questions of me that I will do my best that I can to answer. But again, you guys, and I'll continue if you want me to, but it really, it really comes to a point where you have to realize that there's a lot of historical echoes going on. You know, the Spanish flu is what I'm thinking of right now. People think of, you know, you know, get outside and everything like that, even though it is detrimental. It is not detrimental. It is essential for your mental health too. And that's why instead of just going to the gym, like I used to do doing this, even though it's kind of weak by now, <laughs> um, hope once it's all over, I'm going to be so glad to get back in the gym and start lifting weights again. I'm, gonna, I'm looking forward to that. To get out and I'm, I don't, and I'm kind of like what somebody calls an ambrovert. Um, when my, my brother's, uh, girlfriend told me that last night uh we she came over we had a little family we had a little discussion we had just spent some time talking to each other catching up and uh it's just you know it's really trying to figure out you know like my introvert my extrovert you know that thing and i'm i'm both i like i hate all people but at the same time i love it when i can just be in a room by myself where I get more energy from, you know what I mean? And I'm glad that I have YouTube to talk, you know, we're all human, you know, and just like there's human faces behind Gettysburg and its casualties and the uh, casualties of civil war, there's a human humanity behind everything. Just as it is today, there's human faces behind those who died and those who are infected. They're, they're human. We're all, we're all immortal. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but we're all going to die at some point. I don't know whether I'm going to die this year or the next year. Same thing with Civil War soldiers, civilians. They, they didn't know what day they were going to die or whether they were going to be killed or die from a disease. They didn't know, but they just did what they were told and tried to survive. Whether they, Whether they fought for slavery or not, you know, even though when you look at the aspect of it, though, vast majority have committed. And um, that's why when I study Confederate units and compared to, I'm more of a union guy. I love the union. I'm a union guy. I love union units, especially the first Minnesota, second, sixth, and seventh Wisconsin, 24th Michigan, 19th Indiana, um, 45th New York from the 11th Corps. Um, 26th Wisconsin. Um, you know, all the Wisconsin, all the, I, I'm more, I'm such a union guy. It's unbelievable. Obviously you see my icon is picture of this says Grant, who's my, my opinion, the better general than Robert E. Lee. Um, but it's just really, again, we're, we're all complicated human beings. Just as Grant Lee was how the soldiers and captains who fought under them were, they were all complicated people. Very, very complicated. And um, if we don't realize that, then we lost our humanity as a whole. So anyway, you guys, that's what I wanted to talk about today. Talk about this book. Talk about how it impacted my life. Talk about you, how I feel about this whole thing going on. How we can 
uh, realize these little echoes that are going on so that we can realize to help each other. But also just to realize that memory and history can be skewed. And so once this, once this uh, pandemic ends, we need to make sure that we study the historical realities of the virus and not create myths thinking that this is just a, this is just like flu because it's not. So anyway, guys, this has been my live stream. Thank you for anybody who tune, tuned in or who will watch later. Um, I thank you for watching the stream and sharing it. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, hopefully I gave you some insights, some things to think about. But anyway, guys, I got to tune out here. So I'm just going to probably read another book. I don't know what book I'm going to read, but <laughs> we'll see what happens. Because my term in grad school just ended last week. So probably I have a couple of readings to read for next week for uh, my next term on the Gilded Age and historical lenses. So, But I thought I just wanted to stop by and give a little chat today, talk to you something about mm, is that 33 minutes. That's pretty good. So anyway, guys, you have a blessed day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and remember, don't rely on emotion. Rely on this. Have a blessed day.